Hello there and welcome to the online services of the Franklin Baptist Church. I'm so glad you could join us, even if it is through uh, the video. But uh, we love you, we care about you, we want the best for you inside God's will. And we hope that you're staying healthy and safe. We set our theme at the first of this year as hold fast. It's based on Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And we need to hold fast to our faith, hold fast to that profession of faith. And we would encourage you not to let go. I want to share with you a message today, and it may sound a little bit familiar. We'll cover some of the same themes and ideas that we have looked at as we have looked at and studied uh, this theme uh, for the year and uh, and this idea today of not letting go. I know we emphasized this last in the last video in our last service, uh, but I want to emphasize this again. Don't let go. In the midst of the storms of this life, what are we holding on to? That is probably the most important question that we can ask right now. What are we holding on to right now in the midst of the storms of this life, of the circumstances in which we live today? All of us face difficulties and hardships, and even in the midst of this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic that's, that's hit our world right now today, and how it's so dramatically affected our lives, I know for some it's, it's affected some a lot worse in a lot greater ways than it has others. But at the same time, all of us face hardships and difficulties and the storms of this life and what we are anchored to, what we hold on to is the most important thing, the most important question that we can answer today. Many of us were familiar with that song, the haven of rest, that old time hymn. The chorus says this, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep over wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. I hope today that you are holding fast to Jesus Christ. That profession of faith in Christ is what you are holding fast to. That is where our security is. We're going to be in the book of Psalms, chapter number 27 today. We're going to look at the testimony of David. And David is in an interesting point in time in his life, certainly a tumultuous time, certainly a time of storms and hardship and difficulty. David has been a faithful servant of King Saul. He has faithfully served him. And now at this point in his life, when this psalm was written, David is being persecuted and 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 and. and attacked by King Saul. The king that he loved, the king that he served, has now turned on him and uh, seeks to destroy him. And so David has been on the run. He's been hiding in caves. He's been hiding in the wild. He's been on the run from King Saul for some time. And when he writes these words, we see his real heart. We see what he is holding on to, what his real desire is. And it's not in the sword, it's not in the might of his ability or the, the ability of his men that follow him. His, his faith, his trust is, is not in, in, some, uh, um, in, in the economy, it's not in some political upheaval, it's not in, in a change in leadership or even a change of Saul's heart. You find that he is holding fast to God. He's holding fast to God. In Psalms chapter number 27, we'll start here with the first three verses. The Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And he says, listen, in spite of the, the problems of this world, he talks about the wicked. He talks about his enemies coming upon him. He talks about an army, a host that would encamp against him. He says that his heart will not fear. Even if war would rise against him, he says, in this will I be confident. What is he being confident in? It's what he said in verse number one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That's where his confidence is. It's in the Lord. It's in the Lord who is his light, his salvation. It is the Lord uh, that, uh, that is his strength of his life. 
That's where his confidence lies. That's what he's holding on to. And let me say something to you today. If your confidence, if you're holding fast to their faith in Jesus Christ, if that's what you're holding on to today, then we should see some evidence of it. And we see some evidence of it here in David's psalm that he writes for us that we're going to look at here today. We're just going to look at three verses in this psalm. We're not going to look at the entire thing, but we're going to look at three verses that show us exactly how it is. And it confirms to us that David is holding fast to the Lord. And so let me share with you here these three things. And we're going to start off right there in verse number four. And we're going to see how it is that David's holding fast to the Lord. The Bible says in verse number four, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You find that David has a desire to be with the Savior. He has a desire to be close to the Lord. He has a desire. It is his desire. One thing, he says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. He wants to behold the beauty of the Lord. He wants to inquire in his temple. And these three things all sum up for us this idea that he wants to be present with the Lord. He wants to be in Christ's presence. And that ought to be our desire, is to be close to God, to be where God is, where God is working. That's where we ought to desire to be. We should have a desire to be in His house with His people. We should have a desire to commune with Him in prayer and in His Word. We should have a desire to be as close to God as we possibly can be. That should be a, a desire of our lives if we're holding fast to Christ. That'll be our desire. And not just for this life, but ultimately in heaven as well. Let's look at these three components here of David's desire for the Lord. The first is this. He wants to dwell in God's house. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Now then, for David, uh, this was a tabernacle. This was a tent. And, uh, and in that tent, it housed uh, the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God would meet with mankind. That's where they presented their offerings to God. We know later on, David had a desire to build a temple. He didn't build it, but his son Solomon built a temple. And that's where God chose to dwell and to meet with men. And now today, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that if you're saved, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now you are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And if you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are the temple of God. That's what the New Testament tells us. But understand this, beyond just ourselves housing the presence of the Savior, we have the promise of God beyond that, because God wants to meet with His church. This assembly, this called out assembly of believers, He wants to meet with us. And when we meet together in His house, when we meet together as His people, there's this special presence and this special um, power of the Lord that is there at that time. In 1 Timothy 3.15, the Bible tells us what the house of God is. It says the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Here we have the church. The church is the house of God. This is where God wants to dwell and meet and work through the church as a body of believers. And each of us making up that church, God wants to work through us. And he wants us to be together, to worship together. This is the house of God. The command is given to us in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And it is God's command that we come together as a church, that we assemble together as a church. We should have a desire for that. And not only should we desire it, but we should do all that we can to be a part of that, to make that a part of our lives. The saying's been said, the great task of the church is not only to get sinners into heaven, but to get saints out of bed. I'll tell you something, it shouldn't be hard to get a saint, a Christian, a believer, out of bed to come to church, to be in God's house. Because if you're hanging, holding fast to Christ, if you're saved, if you're born again, if the Spirit dwells inside of you, it should be a joy, it should be a great thing, a great day, when you get to come into the house, into the presence of God with His people. There should be joy and excitement. That Paul said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that have I sought after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that means being part of his church. No, I understand today, certainly in the circumstances in which we live, I know for many of us today, this video may be as close as we can get to church. 
watching this video and, 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 and hearing the message of God's word, it may be about as close as we can get. I know for others right now, we're hosting the, uh, the drive-in services. We're, we're meeting in the parking lot. And everybody's in their own cars with their own families. And, 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 and we're singing and, and, and we're praising God and we're giving an offering and God's word is being preached. And we're all there listening and we're all there engaged and, and a part of it. And that may be as close as some of us can get. My intention, my plan is to very soon open up the doors of this building so that we can come back here. Because I understand this as well. Uh, for many, you know, we have limitations because of our health, because of our physical abilities, because of the circumstances. We have limitations in how we can be engaged with the church. But I also understand this, and we need to understand this as a congregation, as a church, as people today, that there are some people, that, and, and, and ultimately all of us to some degree, we need to be present with one another. We need to be engaged with one another. We need to love one another. We need to encourage and strengthen one another. It's so hard to do that through a video and it's so hard to do that sitting in your car in a parking lot. And so we need to move beyond that, not just to fulfill the command of Christ where it says to us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, but because we need one another. We need that exhortation. We need that love and we need that encouragement. And so here as, we, as you see us make plans to reopen the church and to re-engage with one another, I want you to know we're not doing this uh, lightly. We're not doing this foolishly. We're not doing this uh, haphazardly. We're doing this because it's necessary and it's essential and it's needed. Paul had this great desire. I hope you have that same desire. And even though certain limitations may affect your ability to come and worship with us, even when we open the doors. I hope today that's still your desire. That's still your love. Because you're holding fast to Christ. He says to dwell in God's house, but also to behold God's beauty. Oh my goodness. Listen again to what he says. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. Now we understand when we come together in God's house and even when David would go to the tabernacle or he'd go to worship, he did not see the physical presence of God. But yet he could see his beauty. He could see his beauty reflected in the lives of others. He could see his beauty reflected in God's word. He could see his beauty reflected in how God worked and moved in this world. The beauty of God is not just a physical thing. It goes so far beyond that. And it is an indescribable thing. To, and we can only just touch on the, on the very hem of the garment of what the beauty of God really is. I love this quote. For in glory, he is incomprehensible, in greatness, unfathomable fathomable, in height inconceivable, in power incomparable, in wisdom unrivaled, in goodness inimitable, in kindness unutterable. This, is, this was spoken by Theophilus of Antioch in the second century, and he talks about God beyond description, beyond the ability for us to fully comprehend and grasp all that God is and all, all that God can do and all that God loves us with, but we can catch a glimpse and to behold a little bit of the beauty of God is a wonderful thing. And I'll tell you something, the beauty of God is at work around us. We need to recognize it. We need to appreciate it. We need to desire to see more of it. His mercy, His grace, His love. The, the attributes of God are a beautiful thing. And we need to share that with others. We need to exhibit that in our lives. And we need to seek it out and look for it. He desires the Savior. He desires to dwell in God's house, to behold God's beauty, to inquire in His temple. It said there in verse number 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, I want to inquire in the temple of God. I, I, I want to seek his knowledge and his wisdom and his guidance and his direction. And David recognizes that the guidance and wisdom and direction of God is necessary. It's essential in his life. And folks, we need to recognize the wisdom of God is what we need. We need the wisdom that only God can provide. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, verse number 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He wants us to have that knowledge and understanding and the wisdom that he provides. And we need to seek it out. We need to look for it. We need to get close to him. Can I tell you something? We can learn things the easy way or we can learn things the hard way. 
Are we going to choose to be a student of God and learn things the way he has them presented to us? Or we can go out and learn things the hard way, through trial and error, through mistakes, through pain and suffering and difficulty. I've told the story before, but when I was a kid, probably just in grade school, we had an electric lawnmower. And uh, many of y'all may not have seen an electric lawnmower, but it was, it was just what it's described as. It's electric. It's plugged into an extension cord. And that extension cord is plugged into the wall somewhere on the outside of your home. And so I was cutting the grass in the backyard. Now, my dad had told me I'd never used this lawnmower before. My dad had told me, now, listen, you've got to be really careful when you are uh, cutting the grass. You cannot run over the cord. And if you can imagine that cord trailing along behind you. And of course, I, <laughs> I chose to learn things the hard way. And as I was cutting the grass, I stopped paying attention to where that cord was at. And, uh, and sure enough, I ran over the cord. And guess what happened to that cord? Well, it got cut right in half. And my first clue was that the lawnmower stopped working because the power was no longer getting to the lawnmower. And so I looked and sure enough, there was that cord. It was cut in half. And my first thought was this. My dad told me not to run over that cord. He told me to watch out for that. And I disobeyed and I wasn't paying attention and I cut that cord. And so I've got to pick this up. I got to clean up this mess. And so the first thing I did, I reached down, I grabbed a hold of that cord that was now cut with bare wires exposed, plugged into the wall there outside the garage. And sure enough, not only did I cut the cord, but I got myself a little bit of a volt of electricity, a little shock right there as well. And I'll tell you something, though, I learned, it was the hard way, I learned to not run over the cord. And I learned not to grab bare wires that are plugged into an outlet. I learned a couple valuable lessons that way. Now, listen, it would have been a whole lot better if I just would have listened to my dad and, and, and applied what he said. It would have been a lot less painful. It would have been a lot less difficult. It would have been a lot less worrying over cutting my dad's extension cord. But instead, I learned things the hard way. Can I tell you something? My dad was there to give me wisdom and guidance. If I just would have listened, if I just would have learned, it would have saved me pain and heartache. Can I tell you something? God has got instruction and guidance for us. Now, some things we have to learn by experience. I know it's true, and you know it's true. But yet God offers us his wisdom, his insight, his guidance. If we would turn to him and seek out his will and his plan, we can save ourselves a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of suffering and a whole lot of difficult lessons to learn. Paul says he wants to dwell in God's house. Paul says he wants to be close to the Lord. He desired the Lord and his presence. The Bible says in, in Psalms 84 and verse number 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Being in God's house, being in God's presence is a beautiful thing, a wonderful opportunity. And it's there we're going to behold His beauty. It's there that we're going to be able to inquire at His temple and learn and grow from Him. So let's make sure we have that desire. Make that your desire today. And then we find that for David, this desire, it turned into a dedication. It turned into a promise. It turned into a commitment. We come down here to verse number 8 in Psalm chapter number 27. The Bible tells us here, When thou saidest, he's speaking to God, he says, When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. When he heard God tell him to seek him out, his heart made this commitment, this dedication to God, that I was going to seek him out. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. David dedicated himself to this. Now, first of all, this is an act of obedience because God told him to do this. And that's what he says there. When thou saidest, speaking to God, God told him to seek ye my face. And so out of obedience to God, and, 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 and he, he decides to, to seek God's face. This is God's desire for us, is that we would have this. This is God's order and command for us, that we would seek him out, that we would seek to be close to him, that we would seek his will and his command and his will. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, verses 3 and 4, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye have searched for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And so he says, listen, seek me out. That's God's command. Draw closer to Him. It's the one thing all of us in this world need right now today. Everybody listen to the sound of my voice, including this preacher. We need to be closer to the Lord. We need that closer relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Let's seek him out. And this is for our benefit. This is for David's benefit. Not just for God's, not for God's ego, not for God's you know, uh, 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 desire for anything from us, but rather to be a blessing. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 8 and verse number 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. And I will fill their treasures. God says, listen, he loves those that love him. And those that seek him are going to find him. Why? Because there's riches and honor that are with him. Because he's got fruit that is better than gold. Because he leads in the way of righteousness. And because there is an inheritance of substance with those of us that would seek him out, that would love him, that would draw close to him. This is for our benefit. And so David, he responds in obedience to God, even though it was all for him. And not just because God wanted something from David, but because God God wanted to bless David. This is an act of obedience. And for us today as well, to seek God out, to draw close to him, to dedicate ourselves to the Savior. This is something that we benefit from. It's for our own benefit, for our good. Because of God's fruit and God's riches and God's, God's blessings, his leading in our lives. But for David, this is not just an act of obedience. This is an act of love. It's an act of love. The Bible said in verse number eight, when thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. He responds from the heart. He responds because he does love the Lord, as we read there in the book of Proverbs. He loves the Lord. And because he loves the Lord, he's going to seek his face. He's going to dedicate himself to God. This is a response from, from the depths of his emotions. God is looking today. God is looking to reward those that are seeking him, that are looking for him, that love him. God rewards that. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, 8, henceforth, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. All those that love the appearing, that love the presence, that love to seek out the Lord, God is a crown of righteousness for you. There's this dedication, and it's an act of love. And David's desire became a commitment. It became a dedication of his life. He was now dedicated. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. That's what David said. I'll tell you something right now. We need to hear Christians say, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Now, it's nice to have a desire to be close to the Lord. But I'll tell you something, folks. A lot of times, desire does not move us. Desire, oftentimes, you know, we can sit back and say, I'm good because this is what I like and what I enjoy. But I'll tell you something. It's not enough. And here's the thing. In the church, we desire to see souls saved. That's good. We desire to see the church grow. That's great. But we need people that will do more than just desire it. We need people that will be dedicated to seeing souls saved and dedicated to seeing the church grow and dedicated to seeing the will of God accomplished in hearts and lives. I hope today you have a desire to be close to the Lord, but I hope today you'll dedicate yourself to God because He commands it, because you love Him. Dedicate yourself to seeking him out. He desired the Lord. He was dedicated to the Lord. And now we find he is dependent upon the Lord. So often we struggle to trust God fully with our problems, with our difficulties. We look at the world in which we live today and the problems that we face, the fears that are out there of, of, of this pandemic, of this sickness. And, 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 and so who do we depend upon? And we struggle to trust God. We struggle not to fear. We struggle to, to, to fully rely upon Him. And you know why that is? Sometimes it's because our desires are wrong. Or maybe we have the right desires, but we've never dedicated ourselves to God. Where we fully committed ourselves to His plan. Because when you're fully committed to Him, you're going to have to depend upon Him. And David says here in the book of Psalms, chapter number 27, and verse number 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, and if I can just rephrase this, 
He says, if I didn't believe that God was going to bless, if I didn't believe that God was going to provide, if I didn't believe that I was going to see God in the land of the living, he says, I would have fainted. I would not have made it. I would have been lost as he was being pursued by Saul. If he didn't believe in God and trust in God, he would have given up hope. He would have lost. He, He would have quit. Don't quit today. Depend on God. Don't get discouraged today and overwhelmed today. Depend on God. Trust in Him. Depend on Him for salvation. Oh, please depend on Him for salvation today. You know, the Bible tells us that that it's our faith in God that brings pleasure to God. It's our faith in God that brings about our salvation. Let me encourage you, trust in Him to save you. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, we are saved because of God's grace. We receive that by faith. It is impossible. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, it is impossible to please God without faith but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him you've got to believe in god you got to believe in that plan of salvation you got to believe that he's going to reward those that seek him out depend on him for your salvation do not depend upon your church membership don't depend upon your baptism don't depend on any work of righteousness which you've done depend on god's salvation don't depend on yourself to keep your salvation don't depend upon yourself to live a righteous life don't depend upon yourself to do everything that's right and good to be the right mother or father or to be the right son or daughter or or to be the right co-worker or the right sibling don't depend upon yourself depend upon god to guide and direct and instruct you depend upon god to help you out and 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 folks listen the, the truth of the matter is you don't retain your salvation or your walk with god based upon your own ability It's by our faith in Him. We walk not by by sight, but by faith, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells in Galatians 3.11, the just shall live by faith, trusting in Him each day, each step of the way. We trust in Him. We take medical advice, and that's great. Listen to the doctors, listen to the professionals, listen to the experts. But we're going to trust in God to provide. We're going to trust in God to heal. We're going to turn to Him in prayer and lay the burdens and fears and worries at His feet. Because He's the one we're going to trust. The just shall live by faith. We're going to live by faith in God. Our faith is how we live. Because God responds to faith. We talked about this last week. God is looking for Our faith. God wants to respond to our faith. He's going to respond to faith for salvation. He's going to respond to faith in the way that we live our lives. Not in our own merit, not in our own goodness, not in our own abilities. God's going to respond to our faith in Him. Do you trust Him today? Is your faith in Him today? And I'm not just talking about your salvation. I'm talking about in the midst of the difficulties, in the financial problems that you may be facing, in the health fears that you may be facing, and even some in our church are facing certain health problems right now. Are you trusting in God during this time? Now, God will use doctors and nurses and medicine. God will use, you know, police and military to protect us and keep us safe. God will use a government to help help keep things organized and structured. But I'll tell you something, folks, it is in God that we need to have our faith. Because God's looking for our faith. He responds to our faith. I love the story. Pastor John Bastangio tells a story when his daughter was little. When she was five years old, he was sitting there reading a book. And his five-year-old daughter came in and and said, Daddy, will you build me a dollhouse? And Dad said, sure, and just kept reading his book. And uh, he didn't think anything of it. Sure, at some point he would build that dollhouse. That would happen, I'm sure. And and so then he looked up a little bit later and he saw his little little girl carrying dolls and dishes and other toys out into the yard and making a big pile out in the yard. And his wife was standing close by and he asked his wife, what is she doing? Why is she bringing all her toys out in the yard? And his wife said this. She said, you promised her that you would build her a dollhouse. And she believed you. And now she's acting on it. With that, this was, this was Pastor John Basangio's response. 
He said, you would have thought I'd been hit by an atom bomb. I threw aside my book, raced to the lumber yard for supplies, and quickly built that girl a dollhouse. Now, why did I respond? Because I wanted to? No. Because she deserved it? No. Her daddy had given his word, and she believed and acted upon it. When I saw her faith, nothing could keep me from carrying out my word. Can I tell you something? God is faithful. God wants us to hold on to him. God wants us to trust in him. God wants us to find salvation in him. God wants us to seek out his blessings and his provision and his rewards and his leadership. God wants us to seek out his presence and his beauty and his direction for us. God wants us to turn to him today and to hold on to him today. So don't let go. Because God responds to what you believe in. God responds to your faith. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. The Bible has been written for us that we can know we have eternal life so that we can believe in the name of the Son of God. Where is your faith today? Can I tell you something? Hold on to Jesus Christ. Hold on to your faith in Christ today. And let's have this desire to seek Him out. Let's be committed to seeking Him out. Let's depend fully and totally on Him. You know, right now in our world today, I know there's fears, I know there's worries about our health needs. And it seems primarily there's scares and worries about health needs today. But I'll tell you something, as a church, certainly we care about your health and your well-being. But more importantly, we need to meet the needs of the spiritual needs of the people in our community around this world. And we need to understand the consequences of the church not being all that we were called to be, of the church not holding on to Christ, not desiring Him and being dedicated to Him and depending on Him. Because I'll tell you something, when we are not what we're supposed to be, the consequences ripple throughout our nation and throughout our world. Spiritually, also physically. Many of y'all probably heard some of these reports, and, and I saw this article last week. It was written on May the 9th, and I want to share this with you, just a little bit of this. This article, it says this, in addition to more than 75,000 deaths in the U.S. from COVID-19, the growing epidemic of deaths of despair in the U.S. is also increasing due to the pandemic. And another 75,000 more people will likely die from drug or alcohol misuse and suicide, according to new research released by the Wellbeing Trust and the Robert Graham Center for Policy Studies in Family Medicine and Primary Care. Can you imagine that? 75,000 people dying from COVID-19, another 75,000 dying from what they describe here as deaths of despair. Because people sitting at home, they increase their drug use, they increase their alcohol use. And because they commit suicide, there is an increase, possibly as many deaths from deaths of despair as there is from the coronavirus. What do we do to counter this? Oh, I know people are saying reopen the economy and, 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 and send people back to work. And I think that's all important. But I'll tell you something. People need to have focus and a purpose. But they need to have focus and a purpose. And they need to have hope beyond the economy, beyond their jobs, beyond the physical. They need to have hope and confidence in God. That's what sustains us in times like these. When we are isolated, when we are away from people, when we cannot get out and about, it is our faith in God that's going to sustain us. And it is faith in God that this world needs. They need to see this dedication from us. They need to see our desire. They need to see the impact that Christ can have in lives. And you and I need to share that with the world today. Folks, the truth of the matter is the doors of this church need to reopen. The ministry of this church needs to continue. I hope today it is your desire to be in God's house with God's people. And there are limitations. Not everybody can walk in the doors of this church today. But do what you can to be close to the Lord, to behold His beauty, to hear His word and His guidance and direction, and commit yourself to seeking Him out. Commit yourself to being what He's called you to be, to lead you and guide you and provide for you. And depend on Him right now in the midst of your pain and hurting and suffering and fears and worries. Depend on Him. He is the answer. He is the hope that we need. Hold fast 
to Jesus Christ and don't let go. Today, maybe you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Can I tell you something? Today is the day of salvation. This is the appointed time. He's done all the work. And if we believe that Jesus died for us and rose again and paid the penalty for our sins and intercedes for us with God so that we can have access to God through Jesus, if we believe that and we ask Him to be our Savior and to forgive us of our sins, I'll tell you something, the promise of God is this, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we can know that we have eternal life, the Bible tells us. And if you're a Christian today, make sure you have the right desires. Make sure that you're dedicated to the Lord. And make sure you're depending upon Him. He is our hope. He is our salvation. He is our hope moving forward. Would you join me here as we pray today? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your many blessings. And dear Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus who loves us, who died for us and paid the price for our sins. I pray if there's one here, dear Lord, listening to my voice that's never accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that even today, dear Lord, they acknowledge their sin to you and pray and ask Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. And I pray to Heavenly Father for those that are saved, those believers, I pray to Heavenly Father that even today we would make some decisions that would glorify and honor you that we would examine our desires and what we look from this life and help us to have the Father to desire to be with you, to be close to you, and to, to see your beauty and your instruction and guidance and, and to make a commitment, dear Lord, to seek you out so that we be in your plan and doing your will. And help us, dear Lord, to trust you. We will thank, dear Lord. We will not make it if we're not dependent upon you and on your blessings and on your provision. And I pray to Heavenly Father that today you would provide, that you would bless, that you would meet our needs. I pray to Heavenly Father you would allow us to open up the doors of this building very soon, that we can worship together and serve you together and be, be encouraged and strengthened together, that we might go out and bring the light of the gospel to this dark world. And I pray to Heavenly Father this church would be effective in meeting the needs of the believers that are here and in impacting this world for Jesus Christ. I pray to Heavenly Father for your blessings that this message would just touch hearts and lives and that your will would be done. And Heavenly Father, that you would be obeyed. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We hope to see you again here at the church very soon. Goodbye.